uh, while Chris is pulling that up, he mentioned a couple of upcoming events. One is the spring uh, grazing school, the two-day grazing school that's here in Princeton, April 23rd, 24th. You can register for that online at our Forge website. We've also got three fencing schools. The closest one to here is in Russellville, uh, May 30th. Again, you can sign up on our website. The fencing school has a limited number that can sign up for that because that is very much a hands-on learning to put up um, good permanent fence. Okay, my presentation is on page 45. I've added a few slides, so don't get confused if I show a couple of things that you don't have in your sheet there. So we've talked a lot about novel endophyte fescue, but, but we're not telling anyone to go out and spray out every blade of fescue in your whole farm. Some of you could do that over time, but we're talking about having novel fescue in your farm can provide tremendous benefits. Uh, managing the toxic fescue you have is also very important. And so I'll go through both of those as I go through the presentation. Um, so as Craig showed you this slide, endophyte free has no endophyte. The novel endophyte has that uh, endophyte that doesn't produce the toxins. It's still producing other alkaloids that help the plant survive but it's not producing the toxins. Now, I won't say, uh, oh, the other thing is that you may hear the novel endophyte fescue, you may hear it called a beneficial endophyte, you may hear it called a selected endophyte or non-toxic endophyte, but there is an endophyte, it's just not producing the toxins. Now, we don't mean that you should never plant endophyte-free fescue, but the way I like to look at it, and from our test results, Endophyte free fescue lives in our environment in Kentucky about the same length of, as orchard grass. So if you're satisfied with a four, maybe five year old stand um, and you're managing it really well, then endophyte free is an option. You just have a much shorter stand length than with the novel endophyte. On this, the ergovaline um, slide as well. So Craig talked about this. Um, but remember a key thing, and I'm going to give you a couple of other slides, the vasoconstriction that happens from those toxins, from the ergot alkaloids, um, is constricting blood vessels. That's making it hard for the animals to dissipate heat, so they're heat stressed in the summer. But vasoconstriction, if they're eating fescue hay in the winter, you know, the ergovaline and, and ergot alkaloids drop over in hay, as Craig talked about, but they only drop in half. So poor, I mean, vasoconstriction in the winter, blood not getting down to the hooves, not getting in the tail, you get frostbite, you get hoof loss. Um, so vasoconstriction hurts you both ways, summer and winter. Um, and a number of production issues from toxic fescue. Now, Jimmy Klotz, who um, John mentioned earlier doing some work there in South Carolina, he's at the USDA station in Lexington. He actually developed a technique of taking um, vessels um, that are still um, fresh vessels out of animals, either from the slaughterhouse or actually taking them out um, when the animal's alive and a part of the, part of the um, leg that that vessel's not used, cutting them in little donut shapes. And he can show in the lab, introducing these alkaloids, he can show vasoconstriction. He can show a reducing of the blood area. Um, that can also be shown, as John talked about, with um, um, sonogram or ultrasound, I mean. So you've got endophyte in the um, plant between the cells. You've also got it in the seed, the actual endophyte, the actual fungus. So let me first mention a couple of things about you plant a novel fescue. Uh, what are a couple of key things to remember? And, and this is really kind of a review of what John said. Each forage, you need to manage it differently. Um, alfalfa, you need to you typically manage it for uh, quality hay. You manage it for stand longevities, but you do need some management involved. Um, if you plant annual lespedeza, you need to make sure that it reseeds because in the, it's an annual. You've got to let it come up from seed each year. Um, the main thing with novel in the fight tall fescue is you're managing it for persistence. So talking about getting it well established to start with, as John mentioned. I'm not overgrazing it, particularly in the middle of a hot, dry summer. If you leave animals out there, they're going to graze it into the ground. These are all different reasons that pastures die out, um, but the main two things that are going to be hard on a novel endophyte fescue stand is if you, 
if you say, well, fescue will survive any kind of soil conditions, so I'm, I don't need to fertilize it, I know fescue survives. Kentucky 31 can survive most any condition, but a novel fescue, you go low fertility and then they graze it close, um, you're gonna, it's gonna be hard on it. So, so managing your fertility like your soil test recommendations tell you to, and, and managing or avoiding overgrazing are two key things. Now I'm gonna spend several slides talking about, so let's look at, think about this example on your farm. If you had four paddocks or if you have eight paddocks and you take 25% of those, or one in four, you plant novel fescue. But that still leaves the toxic pastures there. How do you, what do you do about those? How do you, how do you manage that in the system? Okay, we talked a little bit about testing for the endophyte, if it's there or not. Um, we can, um, we'll hear Nick Hill from Agronostics talk about that testing, but you can also send it to the regulatory services um, at University of Kentucky, same place that does your soil testing. Um, if you've got a good stand and it's, and it's maintaining itself and it turns out that you have a low percentage of endophyte, um, then you're in good shape. Um, that stand may decrease over time because it's low endophyte, but that's not one that you worry about in the short term at least. If you have high endophyte um, in that Kentucky 31 stand, then you're either gonna replace it or you're gonna manage it. So I'm talking about managing that stand. Um, now, there's a lot of things talked about as a managing toxic fescue. Um, breed your animals a certain way, um, feed a certain product, don't feed a certain product, um, even spices, um, adding, you know, if you go to a Mexican restaurant and you eat some really hot spicy food and you start sweating, that's actually vasodilation. You know, maybe you can add some of that, and that is in some mineral supplements. But, you know, it gets a little bit dicey. Uh, I mean, you don't want your animals to get, a, get um, addicted to hot spicy food. You know, you might not be able to sustain that. Pet milk. You could chase your cattle around. Now, what's that going to do to an animal that has vasoconstriction and is already heat stressed, and you start chasing them around? Uh, that's going to be pretty hard on them. So let's think about some other things to do. Uh, managing the alkaloids, um, incremental alleviation of the um, fescue toxicity. And I'll go through both of these. I'm going to talk about eight different practices that you can do. Now, these are a couple of slides that aren't in your presentation. Um, they're a little bit different than, than the one there. But this is data from Kentucky. where We went to a pasture, and every month of the year, we checked the ergovaline level. We don't want to confuse it with all these technical terms. Alkaloid would be all these compounds being produced by fescue. The ergot alkaloids are the ones that are toxic. Um, and ergovaline is the one that's in a high percentage um, and, and is the one that's probably been used the most to test for toxicity. So I'm going to show you slides of ergovaline levels. And you say, well, what matters? What's high and what's low? Um, we'll start seeing vasoconstriction typically at about 300 parts per billion of ergovaline. Um, so you start potentially see problems, particularly you get up four to 500, um, you're starting to see more and more issues. Um, but it's not, it's not a perfect rule of thumb. If you hit this one level, your animals fall apart. Um, it's more the higher that it gets, the more stress that's there from things like heat stress, the more issues. So when we tested this pasture every month of the year, just as Craig talked about, we did see a spike there in April, May, and June. Um, both the plants started growing strong. It was early in the season. The plant was growing very healthy, so it produced more of the ergovaline. Um, dropped in the summer, picked back up some in the fall. Um, but the important point I want to make here is that from mid-December through about mid-April, the levels were down here below 200, below 100 in levels that really aren't an issue. Um, so that's a great thing with toxic fescue. It's a great thing to graze stockpiled um, toxic fescue. But you want to wait till there's a couple of hard freezes. You want to, because that's when the ergovalian dissipates. So in October, November, stockpiled tall fescue, um, some years can have levels that would be, would be an issue. Now the problem, I wish we had a perfect curve like this every year. But when we've tested, this is on horse farms that had a lot of fescue. 
Um, and this is a number of different, this is actually over um, 11 years, um, probably something like a thousand paddocks. Here's the averages, but in May we had ergobaline from 100 to 1500. Um, even in the summer, when we typically say it drops, we had levels 100 up here to 800. So that's the problem with just, you say, well, I'm going to test ergobaline. I'm going to find out whether the toxin is there. And you can do that as well. Our vet diagnostic lab will test ergobaline levels. Um, but they vary so much year to year. Now, if you do test ergobaline or you test total ergodalkaloids with the agronostics um, testing, um, the paddocks that are high ergobaline one year typically are the ones that are highest the next year. It just might be that the actual um, levels have varied. So mitigating the toxic fescue. Um, we've talked about, this is actually from a study there at University of Kentucky in Lexington where we measured specific levels. In the seed head, we had levels that were here about 1,100 parts per billion. In some cases that can be 12, 1,200, 1,500, 2,000. Um, they were also very high in that lowest level as John mentioned. Um, but in the leafy part of the fescue, now 500, it still can be an issue, but it's a lot less than the seed head level or the, or the lower level. So um, your grazing management, your mowing management, not grazing too low to the ground, not only will that hurt the plant, but the animals are getting a lot higher level of the toxins. Okay, these are animals in the feed yard. And they were coming, they were cattle that had been affected by fescue. Um, and... Um, these were actually some that the USDA Center, um, I believe this data is from. But the point I'm making here is that when animals were put on feed here for a number of days, um, here is the toxic fescue down the bottom line. They gained weight once they had you know, a good ration. They had corn grain and stuff like that. Um, the endophyte free and the novel endophyte, E++, sometimes we use that to stand for novel endophyte, they gained weight as well. But these endophyte infected um, cattle from, from the toxic fescue never caught up. Um, the stress that was put on them developmentally um, in, the re in the residual endophyte in, or the residual alkaloids in the animal um, continue to have effect even in the feed yard. Okay, incremental alleviation. What are some things you could do? And some of these you'll be familiar with before. So if we say that toxic fescue, um, that's the de daily, day, um, um, daily gain. Maybe it's a pound per day. You add legumes, you increase the gain. Um, you add supplements, you can increase the gain. Um, you good, use good rotational grazing, keep it at a leafy stage, you can add to the gain. Or another solution, rather than trying to do all of those things, is a plant novel and a fescue. But on your infected pastures, you need to be thinking about all of these types of things that I can be doing. So you could dilute the field with planting orchard grass, clover, um, other, I mean, even if you have another grass in there, that's going to help dilute the amount of fescue that they're consuming. Now, so for example, red clover. Some of you may have seen this article or other ones, um, our USDA lab. Um, all, at Lexington also did work in looking at red clover and the benefits that that provides. One of the things is that it, it, it provides a compound that's an antimicrobial compound. Um, again, this slide is not in your presentation, but if you search online, February 2017 hay and forage grower, you'll see a benefit of red clover. But it turns out that the compound that's acting as an antimicrobial, kind of like a, almost a remensin-like compound, um, helping gain on animals eating red clover mixed in with grass, that compound is called biocannin A. That compound is also a vasorelaxant. Um, and so this is an actual uh, ultrasound. Here's animals eating toxic fescue, consuming that in a pasture with their vessels constricted. Um, when they were put, even several days after they were put on a diet that could still contain the toxic fescue, about two thirds of their diet, one through their diet, red clover, um, that compound of biocannin A actually dilated the blood vessels. So red clover is a benefit. I mean, any clover 
and, and, and the other legumes contain some of those compounds, also acts as a dilution. But red clover is one of the best because of that specific compound, the biocanon A. Okay, supplement. Um, here's number two out of the eight that I'm talking about. Um, supplement with corn gives a, gives a small increase from the control. The control would mean toxic fescue. Um, a number of other things you can do, but you notice that just giving supplement by itself, you don't see a huge um, difference. You don't see doubling the, the rate of gain. Um, here's work done by Glenn Aiken before he retired at USDA in Lexington. So right here was the gain he got, pounds per steer per day, with toxic fescue um, just by itself, uh, 1.59. When he added an ear implant, he got 13% higher pounds per day of gain. When he added soybean hulls, he got 31% increase in gain. When he added the ear implants and soybean hulls, he got a 70% increase in gain. So supplementation um, can matter a lot in what you're doing and, and to, to add several things like the adding the implants can help on toxic fescue. Rotate to a summer pasture. John mentioned that with the spray, smother, spray. Don't just use that summer crop as a smother. Um, obviously use it so animals are consuming that in the summer and you're relieving them from being on the toxic fescue. So you add um, a rotational grazing system with endified infected fescue, the, the toxic type um, with sedan grass, and you get an incremental increase in steer gain per day. But if you take endophyte free or, or novel endophyte fescue, you get an even greater pounds per day of gain. And if you add sedan grass to that, you get even more. So all of these points I'm trying to make is to say that taking toxic fescue, it's hard just to cure animals, the animal toxicity effects with that, but you can help. Limit nitrogen. Nitrogen increases the alkaloid concentration. The alkaloids produced in fescue, they're um, secondary compounds. So a fescue plant that is growing really well is also going to have more kind of um, excess capacity to produce those secondary compounds. Um, high nitrogen is associated with toxicosis. Before they ever even realize that the endophyte um, in fescue caused the problem, um, they, they, for a while there, thought it was chicken litter caused the problem because they saw that stands that had had a lot of chicken litter had more toxicity, but it's because the fescue was growing so well. It was that, it was that nitrogen effect. So um, just an example, with zero nitrogen, here's ergovalin in the leaf. Um, this is from a study um, right in the house in 1991. 60 pounds of nitrogen made it 300 parts per billion, 120 was 500 parts per billion. Um, you, the stem and the sheath, um, you were 500 with no nitrogen. You were almost 600 with 60 pounds. You were over 1,000 um, there in, this, in the stem and the sheath of the plant um, with that high nitrogen. The seed head was even more. Um, I've already kind of mentioned this, clipping the seed heads. Oh, yes, sir. Good, good question. We never looked at that ex exactly. One of the things with clover is you've got really a slow release nitrogen. You don't have that shot of nitrogen all at once. The other thing, the clover is giving so many, so many benefits that even though the fescue is growing a little bit better, that that way outweighs. Um, you know, I don't know if we've ever looked at that I exactly. G good question. But you saw there where we went from 60 to 120. Those high level, high rates are really where you see the issues. So, um, again, clipping seed heads is not a perfect solution, but is, but is helpful. Um, this is a study, um, Missouri, Georgia, South Carolina, and John and Craig, correct me, I believe what you all were doing was keeping, the, keeping it mowed the entire season to a certain height, and the ergovalene levels um, were kept fairly low, April, May, June, July, so that was a good thing. Um, not over 400, but even in the fall, even where it was regularly mowed, um, even in that leafy material, we did get into some high levels um, those particular years of that study in all three locations. You can ammoniate hay to reduce ergovalene. Um, now, this is not something that we 
recommend very much, partly because it's pretty hazardous to be ammoniating hay. If any gets out there, it can be quite toxic to the people. Um, you cover the hay with plastic. Um, you inject it with anhydrous ammonia. Um, that can be a way to increase the effective um, nitrogen, effective um, protein in the, in the material, but it also reduces ergovalein. Um, but so the lowest levels in reducing the ergot alkaloid concentration were in the ammoniated hay. The next lowest were just regular hay. Then sile, as, as Craig mentioned, um, don't, um, don't cause that much of a drop. Gray stockpiled late, I've already mentioned that. Um, grazing stockpiled after a couple of hard freezes. Um, you've got that benefit as from here, um, mid-December through April. Now, not this past winter, I'm trying to remember if it, was, if it was last winter, two years ago or three years ago, where we had a very mild fall. Um, in fact, we didn't get much weather in the 20s until early March. And the fescue did maintain higher levels of ergot alkaloids um, through that particular winter. Um, so those couple of hard freezes are important to really drop it down into those negligible levels. There's a um, fairly new herbicide called Chaparral. Um, that herbicide is a, it's a combination of two herbicides, but a real benefit, I mean, it is a herbicide. It does kill broadleaf weeds, but it also will suppress fescue seed heads. Um, improves the rate of gain, the winning weight, the pregnancy. A lot of that improvement is because it's keeping the plant at a leafy stage. So um, Dr. Aiken, Glenn Aiken there at the USDA lab looked at animals going into a fescue field with seed heads, and they often like the seed head. Animals don't know that they're eating that ergot alkaloids. It doesn't taste bitter to them. They like seed head because of their high carbohydrates. So they'll actually get quite high levels if they're grazing something at the seed head stage. Um, here's chaparral two weeks after application when it was applied, um, when the plants were at a um, vegetative stage, um, just starting to expand. Um, here's um, a regular herbicide grazed on next compared to chaparral. Chaparral will stunt the fescue a bit. And it doesn't just remove the seed heads. Um, here's what was the chaparral was applied at a boot stage of growth. Um, here's the, that regular graze on next herbicide. Um, that whole field is going to seed. So we killed weeds right here, um, but with toxic fescue, that would be a, a, a real issue, uh, whereas we had suppressed the seed heads with a chaparral application. Um, here's an example of two animals, untreated, that Brangus heifer, uh, had that rough hair coat, wasn't nearly as slicked off going into the summer as were the chaparral treated. Yeah. I don't have that exactly. Um, that would, it's probably going to be in a 20 to 25 dollars per acre. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and we're not, we, we definitely don't want to tell everybody you need to be spraying a herbicide every year. Um, partly because we'd really like you to have clover in your stands, even your novel in the fight stands, and you're going to take all the clover out. Um, but that, that is a solution. And in fact, if you're during the year that you're going about doing your reseeding, you could spray chaparral to kill weeds, to knock back seed heads so you don't have to worry about those infected seed lasting, and then go into your double spray in mid-June. So that's, that's an option to kind of combine both. Somebody had a question over here? It, it would be quite effective with buttercup, sprayed at that spring. Well, the only problem is the buttercup, you really like to spray that um, back late February, early March, and that won't, that won't, that's too early to suppress the seed heads. You've got to wait till the fescue's up, kind of almost to boot stage for it to work well. And then by then, the buttercup's probably flowering. So it would kill it, but you couldn't use it for this fescue seed head suppression. Um, so the recommendations from several years of testing with chaparral is the time to spray it would be from mid-April up until about the boot stage. So you don't want the seed head already out because it's not going to suppress it then. Um, but even at the boot stage, it keeps it from developing further. Um, so mid-April till early May, if you spray it earlier, then it can be actually pretty hard on the fescue and set it back. Rotationally stocked, those pastures sprayed with chaparral. 
Um, don't spray it if you want to keep your clover, because like I say, it's a very effective broadleaf herbicide. Um, here's a couple of contacts. Um, so Dow Agrochemical, now called Corteva, is the one that sells that product. It's the Metribucin. Um, Cimarron is the a, a product with that, and it. The other part is the Minipyrrolid, same active ingredient in um, like Grazon Neck. So it's it's the Metribucin that's actually doing the seed head suppression. Um, so here's all those things we talked about with alleviating it. Now let's talk about adding that proportion of novel novel um, endophyte into your pasture rotation and how you manage that system. Okay, you've got novel fescue, you've got toxic fescue. How do you kind of fit those things together? Um, how much non-toxic forage is needed? Um, when should it be used? Managing the forage deficit during the transition. John gave one example. You plant a summer annual um, during that year before you plant the novel. That gives you some feed during that transition phase. So here's a couple of very important slides. Um, and this is a suggestion from um, um, a presentation given at University of Tennessee. In terms of management, if you can remove cows from toxic fescue 30 days before and 30 days after breeding, then you can reduce the effect on reduced pregnancy. Um, so I just want to give, give an example from a study at University of Arkansas where they had a 25% of the area that the animals were grazing had been renovated to non-toxic or novel fescue. 75% was toxic. And then they compared that to just standard Kentucky 31 toxic fescue. Um, Cow-calf pairs were grazing the non-toxic 30 days before the start of breeding season and till about three to four weeks after, um, during the breeding season. Um, but remember, well, let me just keep going here. So 100% toxic fescue in this particular study, the calving rate, the actual live calves that were uh, birthed um, were 44%. 100% novel fescue was 80%. Um, you know, not as good as you'd like it to be, but, but a huge improvement. Um, even 25% novel fescue. So they were on there 30 days before breeding, um, almost 30 days into the breeding season. Um, we had 80% calving rate. But notice here with the 100% novel, we had... The weaning weight was 522, um, 449 on the 100% toxic. Um, we didn't, just having 25% novel didn't help that much the weaning weight because you had to have them back on the toxic fescue um, a fair bit of the season, a fair bit of that time that they were growing. Okay, 100% toxic with fall calving. Now, this in essence is saying that a great way to alleviate toxicity uh, if you've got toxic fescue, is fall calving. So the calving rate was 96%, 100% toxic fescue. Um, spring calving and 100% toxic was 44, like we showed you earlier. Spring calving and 100% novel was 80. Um, so one, one really good solution if you've got a lot of toxic fescue is, is fall calving. Um, but still here where we had the 100% novel, we got better weaning weight, um, even with, when we had fall calving. So just summarizing this, toxic fescue, um, our conception was low. The novel, the 100% or even the 25% increased conception rates. Spring calving, um, this is on toxic fescue. Um, low conception, um, much better with fall calving. So summarizing all of that, partial renovation, just 25% of your farm, um, resulted in improved calving rates for spring calving cows. 25% um, renovation. Um, the only problem with that is it didn't cover the whole breeding season, so it helped a lot, um, and it definitely didn't cover later in the year. So complete renovation um, not only reduced, um, reduced calving interval, increased weaning weight, calf average at a gain, and, and calf value at weaning. So the, the main point from this slide is that for spring calving cows, having 
even just 25% novel fescue makes a huge difference. So renovate where you're going to have the most immediate benefit. Um, annually convert what you're comfortable with. We've talked about conversion strategies and establishment strategies. Manage the forage production and use from renovation acres um, prior to seeding the non-toxic. We talked about that with like not letting it go to seed. Um, adjust your typical grazing patterns um, at, during that renovation process and, and during those months after you've established the novel fescue. Now, I'm going to, Chris, how am I for time? I'm about finished? Just about. Okay. So my, my main point is that if you're taking a pasture out and you're seeding a new one and we're telling you to go easy on that new novel fescue for that fall and the next spring, what do you do with the forage deficit? Okay, um, a summer annual can help during that year before you're seeding. Um, maybe having, in essence, if you've got a really high stocking rate, um, you're already kind of pushed to the limit, then it's going to be pretty hard without bringing in some extra feed to establish a novel. We're talking about a lot of benefits to that, but you still got to think about how do I manage that forage deficit. Now, one thing that we haven't mentioned too much, I've got a few copies of our um, tall fescue variety test report back here, and I just wanted to make the point that if you've got just an old pasture that's Kentucky 31, even a good stand, and you plant a new anything, orchard grass, end of fight free fescue, something else, you're going to typically get, I mean, we, we, tip, we um, almost always on fall plantings, either the year after planting, we'll be up in a five to six ton range with good nitrogen fertility um, on tall fescue. Same thing with orchard grass. Sometimes we don't get as much of a yield increase that first year, but we do the second year. So a newly seeded stand of, of a range of grasses gives more yield than just an old stand, even an old stand that's, that's fertilized. So think about how you manage that deficit, um, but I think there's ways to manage it, and, we, and we've talked about that, but that obviously is a consideration. I'm just going to flip through these because I think that's kind of obvious what I'm talking about. Um, and the, the last comment, and we've said it and we'll say it again, is that as Jeff commented, if you just, if you plant novel fescue and you think that'll cure all your problems and you just graze it um, continuously, like we've done at the research station, um, then in three years, that stand, Jeff, was about 40% fescue because we never really let it get fully established in a good sod, and then we didn't treat it in a rotational grazing system. So there's... If, if, if you're not going to go about uh, managing your grazing, then it's definitely not the, worth the expense to plant a novel fescue. Um, so carefully manage, um, for example, like that, that um, harvest for hay the following spring, minimize contamination of newly renovated acres, not feeding infected hay on those acres, um, seed head control of the non-renovated acres. Um, here's our forage website. We mentioned it before. Um, just Google KY Forages. We've got upcoming events. We've got over 150 publications. And Chris mentioned earlier the KY Forages YouTube. Um, so you could go back there and see um, a talk Chris gave um, several months ago on building a grazing system around tall fescue. You could go back and look at our um, hay production um, meetings that we had back in January. Um, all the last, well, actually several years of presentations, Chris, would be on this KY Forge's YouTube channel. Okay, questions? <laughs>